it's shaking, everyone. <laughs> How's it going? Griff Hamlin from Blues Guitar Unleashed here with you today. I'm going to talk about practicing for soloing. Now, this is going to be talking about different beats and different subdivisions and how we can practice that stuff to get good at it. First question that's probably going to pop into your head, maybe not, but one of the biggest questions that I get a lot about this is why. Okay, so it's, it's actually pretty simple. When you solo, let's say that you're soloing in the key of C, okay? So let's say that you're playing your good old C minor pentatonic scale, right? Good old box one. Right? Let's say we're using that. And, you know, we're playing over some changes. Maybe it's a slow blues. Maybe it's a shuffle blues. Maybe it's a, a kind of a rock and roll straight feel blues. It doesn't really matter. There's two things you can do <clears throat> when you get right down to it. There's only two things. One is you can alter the order that the notes come, right? Because obviously if I practice, if I, if I solo, like that, it's gonna get kind of old, kind of fast. I'm just playing the scale up and down, okay? So what I can do is I can alter the order that the notes come in. Even that's going to get a little tedious if I don't do some of the second thing, which is I can alter that scale rhythmically. Okay, so I do, instead of just playing straight eights, right, I maybe play some quarter notes or some half notes, right, I change things up. Okay, so either you're going to play with the order that the notes appear or you're going to play with the rhythms. That's about it. <laughs> I don't, I don't know how to tell you this, but there ain't anything else. I don't want to make it more complicated than it actually is. That's it. That's all you've got. Okay, so obviously, you know, we practice the scale so that we get the notes down. Okay, well, that helps with, you know, being able to change up the order of the notes. We learn licks so that we can learn common ways to move our fingers in, you know, and, and get vocabulary that sounds bluesy, right? but it's really easy to kind of sort of not really do that rhythmic part so much. And in, at least in my experience, and, and it's, you know, I'm sorry to say coming up on a lot of experience, 32 years in November that I've been teaching. <laughs> it's a long time, actually 33 years in November that I've been teaching guitar. It's, it's, it's a long time. And I wish I knew you know, when I was younger. As a young teacher, I, I often say that I learned more than I taught. And I'll be the first to admit that. The first eight or 10 years that I taught guitar, I, I swear I probably learned more than I taught. But the older I got, the more that I did it, the more I could see that, that focusing on this rhythmical element makes all the difference, okay? So I'll be the first to admit that today's, if, if you're watching this video later on and you're like, where's the cool lick? It's not gonna happen, okay? What I'm gonna teach you today is gonna make you a much better guitar player much better. If you practice this, if you give this 15 minutes out of your day each and every day, you are going to be a much better guitar player all around. It doesn't matter the style of music. But if you're just looking for a lick, this is not for you. Hit pause, hit stop, go on. That's fine. I, I don't, I don't, I'm okay with that. I just want to make sure you know what you're in for if you're going to stick around with me here for a little bit. So let's first talk about really quick a metronome, okay? I'm going to get to this, but my metronome is ridiculously fancy and does nothing but beep, okay? We are going to use a metronome assuming you are at a certain point, okay? So my metronome is crazy fancy. I think it cost $11 28 years ago. <clears throat> and uh, and so I, you know, most people have them in their phones now and I have one on my phone too and they'll do fancy stuff. I don't want it to do anything fancy, okay? so. The first thing is we can play our scale in straight eighth notes, right? So the way we play eighth notes, we subdivide the beat in half. One and two and three and four and, right? One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and. Now it doesn't matter how fast you go. 
Okay, if you can't do it up to, if you can't do it fast, go slow. Go as slow as you gotta go. I don't care if you gotta do this. One and two and okay, doesn't matter. Three and just keep going. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and right. Do it up and down, up and up and up and down, up and down. I don't know, ten times. Whatever that, whatever it takes, okay, it's fine. Count out loud. Your ears have to hear your voice. Why? I don't know. I just know that it works. I've seen it hundreds, if not thousands of times. So you just kind of have to trust me on that one. I've never researched why it matters. Somebody watching this might be a brain surgeon can tell me why. That'd be awesome, okay? Um, <laughs> but the reality is it works. If you can hear your own voice, it works better, okay? So that is straight eighth notes. So first thing you're gonna do, pick a box, pick a pattern. You, you can do this with, you know, box one. You could do it with box four. You could do it with the alter dominant scale. You know, it's it <laughs> doesn't matter, okay? I use this same idea for every scale at some point. I use it for even things that are not scales. I do things like arpeggios. One and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and... Okay, I, it truly doesn't matter what it is. Whatever you have to practice on, some, uh, some pattern that you're working on anyway, you might as well add this into the mix. How's that? Where you kind of double duty that way, right? Okay, so first thing we wanna do is straight eighth notes. Next thing we wanna do is triplet eighth notes. How do we do triplet eighth notes? We're gonna subdivide the beats into three pieces. One and da, uh, two and da, uh, three and da, uh, four and da, uh, one and da, uh, two and da, uh, three and da, uh, four and da, uh, one and da, uh, two. Again, count out loud. If you can hear your voice, it works a whole lot better. So we have straight eighth notes. We have triplet eighth notes or eighth note triplets. Swing eighth notes. We're gonna play one and, notice I don't play anything on the and, uh, I'm gonna play, right? This is gonna give us that bump, ba bump, ba bump, that kind of bouncing, what we call swing eighth notes. One and a uh, two and a uh, three and a uh, four and a uh, one and a uh, two and three and a uh, four and a uh, one and a uh, two and a uh, three and a uh, four and a uh, one and a uh, two. And again, I don't care. One and a uh, two and a uh, three and a uh, four and a uh, one and a uh, two and a. Uh, or maybe you're playing like box four over here because that's what you got to work on. One and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a... It does not matter. You can switch patterns. You can do what... I don't care about the patterns. What matters is that you choose one that you feel comfortable with or that you need a little practice on still, and you count this way. So we have straight eights. We have swing eights. We have... Uh, uh, sorry, eighth note triplets. We have swing eights, and we want to do sixteenth notes. That's four subdivisions. One E and da, uh, two E and da, uh, three E and da, uh, four E and da, uh, one and da, uh, two E and da, uh, three E and da, uh, four E and da, uh, one E and da, uh, two E and da, uh, three E and da, uh, four E and da, uh, one E and da, uh, two E and da, uh, three E and da, uh, four E and da, uh, one E. If it's one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two, it doesn't matter what the pattern is. I hope I've made that quite clear by now. But hey, it's blues guitar unleashed, so I'm using a blues scale, minor pentatonic, right? So we have straight eighths, eighth note triplets, swing eighth notes, and sixteenth notes. Four different subdivisions of the beat. Notice that in straight eighths, we're dividing each beat into two pieces. For both eighth note triplets and swing eighths, we're subdividing each beat into three pieces. And for 16th notes, we're subdividing each beat into four pieces. Now, does it matter if you say one and a, two and a, or if you say one triplet, two triplet? No. Can you say one grapes pairs? I don't care. <laughs> it 
<laughs> say whatever you want. The last thing I care about is what you call those those beat fragments. All right, I use one E and a for, for 16th notes. You wanna call it one A, B, C, knock yourself out. I don't think it really matters, okay? In my experience, nobody's ever actually done that, but you know, maybe maybe somebody maybe somebody's mind thinks that way. I don't think it really matters. The important thing is that you can do that, okay, at a comfortable pace. Now, for whatever reason, the magic pace is 60 beats a minute. And I don't and and those of you who have heard me talk about my my caged exercise with learning the five uh, C E G E N D chord shape have also heard this about that 60 beats per minute kind of being the magic number. Here's the thing though, don't turn on the metronome until you can comfortably go through straight eights, eighth note triplets, bouncing eights, and 16th notes. Okay, you should be able to do a couple of passes each. It should look something like this. Again, if I'm using box one in, uh, in C minor, this is kind of what this would look like. Okay, I would do something like this. Um, you know, 60 beats a minute is about one count per second. So I'm gonna kind of make a guess at to what that is. Uh, one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and one and two and three and four and... So this is my straight eights, right? One and two and three. Now I want to go to triplets. One and a two and a three. About the same speed. A two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a one. A two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four and a one and a two and a three and a four. So notice that I'm keeping about that same rhythm. You, you might be able to see my foot tapping there. Same speed, right? One and a two and a three and a four and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four. One e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one e and a two e and a three e and a four e and a one. Right? So if I was practicing at this at home and it was new to me, I'd probably do at least a half a dozen up and downs before I went on to the next one. I'm trying to kind of get through it quickly, so I'm only doing once up and down. But you get the idea. That has to be comfortable without the metronome. It, it absolutely must be comfortable without the metronome. If it's not, turning on the metronome is not going to give you time. And I will reiterate that till the cows come home. I can't tell you how many students I've watched where I, you turn the metronome on, okay, and the metronome's going, and they're like, oh yeah, I just gotta play to the metronome, okay, and it, it's going this, you can watch my leg to see how fast it's going if you can't hear it, right? And they'll do. Nowhere near this, right? It's, it's completely, the notes fly out at random. If you don't follow that metronome, that metronome is doing you no good, okay? So when I say follow that metronome, your foot has to hit the ground every time that thing beeps. If it doesn't, you're not following it. And you have to say one, two, three, four, one, two. You have to say those downbeat numbers when that beep happens. Otherwise, you're not following it. If you're saying the number at a little bit before that, you need to slow up a little bit. If you're saying that number a little bit after it, you need to, to pick it up, okay? So assuming that you can comfortably play without the metronome and you can count and you can go at what you feel might be a consistent pace, all right? I'm gonna break this down to 60. And I hope you may or may not be able to hear that, but that's all right. You can watch my foot. So one, two, three, here's straight eights. Two and three. Yes, I still count. One and two and three and four and one and two, three and four and one and a two and a three and a four and a one, two and a three and a one, a two, a three, a four, a one, a two, a three, four, a one, a two, a three, a one and a two. That 
is how that ought to look. If you can do it at 60, now you can start to increase the speed. But if you can't do it comfortably at 60, don't try to go any faster. It's going to be a huge train wreck. <laughs> okay. So again, this is a way that will get you counting. It will get you being way more comfortable switching back and forth between straight eighth notes, triplet eighth feel, and sixteenth feel. And then when you're playing something, you know, I can go back and forth between those triplets and straight feels and it adds a huge amount of interest and excitement to your solos because they don't sound that, 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 that. They don't have that eighth note iris. It's a big deal. It will really make your solo sound a lot better in a very short amount of time because you can feel and deal with the beat. Okay? So I hope that makes sense. I hope you got something out of today's video. Again, I'm Griff Hamlin from Blues Guitar Unleashed. As always, if you're watching me on YouTube, subscribe. If you're watching me on Facebook, like or follow or whatever it is that you do on the Facebooks. Uh, you can check out more at bluesguitarunleashed.com if you have guitar playing friends. I hope you will share this with them, and I will talk to you soon. Take care.